Hey, it's Amy with Behind the Tweet. So when I talk about the microbiome and persistent pathogens that can contribute to chronic inflammatory conditions, you'll see that I often mention well-known pathogens like the herpes virus and Epstein-Barr virus and cytomegalovirus and also bacterial pathogens like M. tuberculosis. But I also often refer to many other different pathobionts or persistent pathogens that are now understood to be capable of persisting in the human body and that can contribute to different chronic inflammatory conditions. Um, and by the way, again, pathobionts are microbes that can persist in a microbiome ecosystem and not drive symptoms under certain conditions, but they can change their gene expression to act as serious pathogens under conditions of immunosuppression or imbalance. So I wanna make the point today that our microbiome communities are often filled with pathobionts and potential pathogens or pathogens in themselves. And we have an exploding amount of data on these uh, you know, growing range of persistent pathogens that can contribute to chronic inflammatory diseases. So I thought about it and I said, you know what I'm gonna use as an example? I'm gonna talk about the bladder microbiome and then I wanna show you a study called the urinary tract infection microbiome. Very interesting study. So when I'm talking about the bladder microbiome to begin, um, this shows you how far we've come. Just a couple years ago, the bladder was still regarded as completely sterile. Um, in fact, in the first human microbiome project that sequenced microbes um, in different areas of the human body, body, the bladder was not included because it was still regarded as such a sterile, immunoprivileged organ. But recently, teams began using computer-based tools, those tools I've been describing, to better look for the presence of microbes and viruses and fungi and even bacterial phages in the human bladder. And they definitely found many organisms. So in just the last couple of years, because we've turned these computer-based tools onto the study of the bladder and the microbes it contains, we've realized that there's an incredibly large number of microbes that can persist in this area of the body. So let me go over that more specifically with you. First, um, I'll link below um, to a study that you could just reference, a 2018 paper called Culturing of the Female Bladder, published in Nature. And that's a good study to look at if you just want to get an idea of bacteria that can persist in the bladder. Um, many of the, subject in the, in the subjects in the study were asymptomatic or healthy, so you can get a better idea of what the bladder microbiome might be like in a healthy individual. Um, but there are a couple of statements from that paper that I want to read out loud. Um, one is, contrary to medical dogma, urine is not sterile, even in asymptomatic individuals. Okay, that, that's the first statement. Um, done. Paradigm over. Okay. The second thing then is I want to progress to um, what happens to the bladder microbiome in a UTI, a urinary tract infection. Um, for most of uh, time, even now, if you get a UTI and you go to the doctor, um, you will be told that there's a possibility that we, we know it's an infection, but mostly if you do a urine test, uh, sometimes people are given antibiotics based off um, just the symptoms of a UTI, but often they're asked to do a urine analysis test, and that test is sent to a lab where the researchers and the lab basically, or the, the people in the lab, culture um, and look for one pathogen. E. coli. Um, and sometimes if the UTI is deemed to be complicated, um, they will attempt to culture a couple, a handful of other bacterial species out of that urine sample. So um, this paper that was published in 2018 confirms that. They say, for over 60 years, the standard urine culture protocol has represented the primary tool for detecting bacterial in clinical microbiology laboratories. This aerobic protocol is particularly effective at detecting abundant E. coli, but little else. So we have been basically looking for a single pathogen in, in patients with a UTI. Now, when we turn these computer-based tools of researchers, I'm going to show you a study where researchers at the J. Craig Venter Institute used two different computer-based tools to look for bacteria, fungi, and viruses in the bladder microbiomes of patients with urinary tract infections, UTIs. And this is what they found. This, I'm gonna show you right now, is a figure from that paper. These are the bacteria that they found 
um, in urine samples taken from patients with UTIs. So they obtained um, 121 urine samples from patients with UTIs. And interestingly, these were samples, and I'm not sure about the details, that had been deemed to have no value. They had been discarded. I assume that maybe they had uh, attempt to culture a coal out of them and it hadn't worked and they were going to be thrown out. But obviously they had plenty of information in them when this team at the J. Craig Venner Institute used their two computer-based tools to look um, for microbes. This is what they found. Just take a look at all of these bacterial species that were found in the urine of patients with UTIs. Um, you can see that most of the uh, microbes there, most of these bacterial species are pathobionts or pathogens. You can see enterobacter. You'll see chlamydia species. You can see urea plasma. You can see mycoplasma. You can see Pseudomonas aeruginosa. You can see Prevotella. You can see Campylobacter. You can see Proteus. You can see Klebesia. You can see so many pathobionts or pathogens are capable of persisting in a patient with a UTI. So to be clear, not every person with a UTI, not every urine sample contained all of these bacterial species. These were the bacteria that were detected in all of the urine samples, but still, each urine sample taken from a patient with UTI contained on average about 41 different species in it. And on top of that, about two fungal species and about three viral species, also in the same urine sample taken from an individual patient with a UTI. And to be clear, those fungal species um, that, that could be detected, that were detected in the urine, included Candida albicans, Candida glabrata, uh, Candida tropicalis, and uh, Malastesia, um, uh, including an, and a number of other fungal species. And the viruses that were, they were found, that were found in different UTI um, urine samples included human papillomavirus, um, the BK and JC polymoviruses, um, herpes virus 6, and anellovirus, for example. So, you know, each person who, who had a sample in this study had a range of bacterial species, fungal species, and viral species in their UTI urine sample. So what a new explosion of knowledge. Now, there's a couple implications of those findings. It doesn't, and we don't know, we still need further research. It doesn't appear that a UTI might be driven by a single pathogen. A UTI, based off that data, may be a polymicrobial condition or a condition driven by different pathogens or pathobionts interacting together. Um, that data strongly suggests that to me. If you can find 41 bacterial species in a single sample taken from one patient with a UTI, then surely those microbes may be acting together um, to drive symptoms of a UTI, in addition with the fungi and the viruses that were found in the samples. So we may not be looking at a condition caused by a single pathogen, but a condition in which different pathogens interact together. And secondly, what's interesting is not every urine sample contained the same mix of pathogens which means that the symptoms of a UTI, difficulty with uh, problems with urination and pain, um, may develop in different people, um, may be uh, developed from a different mix of microbes in different people. So a UTI, even, it may be a polymicrobial condition in which different mixes of microbes and pathogens may drive uh, the chronic infectious state in different patients. Um, so those are two big things, and I think you'll see those trends um, hold for a different num for, for a range of chronic inflammatory conditions that I'll discuss in future videos. Um, bacteria, viruses, and fungi can often act together to drive an infectious process, and patients with the same diagnoses often don't have to have the exact same mix of those pathogens or pathobionts to present with similar symptoms. Two key trends. So. Um, one thing I wanted to also mention is that, it, to me, a UTI is often a chronic inflammatory condition in the sense that many UTIs are recurrent. Um, patients who get one UTI are often given antibiotics. I'm not sure uh, what the antibiotic does. It probably knocks down some pathogens that are in that mix of what we saw in that figure. But in addition, um, you know, after that antibiotic, it's very common that a couple months later, the patient will get another UTI. 
and then they may take another round of antibiotics. And then after a couple months, they may unfortunately get another UTI. And so a UTI for many people is a relapsing, remitting, chronic infectious condition that we now see is tied to a range of persistent pathogens or pathobines. Um, so on top of that, um, let me just blow your mind a little more, or at least uh, blew my mind. There was a recent study done called bacteriophages of the urinary microbiome. And I will soon put up the figure from that, but what I want to tell you is that when you look at the figure from this study, these are researchers who looked for bacteriophages in the urine. Um, and what they did was take urine samples and they were searching for bacteriophages, which if you remember are viruses that infect bacteria and modulate the uh, bacterial activity and behavior. So when they did this, they looked at 100 different, um, 181 different bacteria that were capable of persisting in the urine, and they found 457 bacteriophages that were capable of infecting those bacterial species in the urine, in the samples that they had in this study. 226 of those bacterial species, bacteriophage species were predicted with a very high level of confidence. So here is the figure. The, 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 the names you see written out are bacterial species. And if there's a dot on the center of the figure next to the name of that bacterial species, that means a phage or bacteriophage was identified as being able to infect that bacterial species um, with a high degree of confidence. So in fact, 86% of the genomes, the bacteria, examined in the study contained at least one bacteriophage sequence in them because these are viruses that infect bacteria. So these bacteria, 86% of the bacteria had bacteriophages infecting them when the analysis was performed. So this just adds to the layers of, of persistent uh, organisms involved in this. In a UTI, and this, this was just done, this wasn't a UTI analysis with the bacteriophages. These were just phages, bacteriophages that can infect bacteria in the urine. So we have to assume now that moving forward, we're going to have to add bacteriophages into the mix of those organisms that can contribute to a urinary tract infection. So that's a long call from E. coli being implicated in a UTI all on its own. So um, lastly, I wanted to say that, it, you know, these identifying all these new organisms that can contribute to a UTI or to a, a different bladder condition or simply persist in even the healthy bladder is such a revolution because it allows us to study yet other conditions with so much novel information. So for example, there's a bladder condition known as interstitial cystitis. And this is a condition in which uh, patients develop chronic uh, symptoms, bladder symptoms, uh, a lot of pain with urination, uh, cramps, uncomfortable symptoms, uh, pain with sexual intercourse. It's a really severe, debilitating condition. And in these patients, urine samples at a doctor's office, that, that early test I mentioned, in which you know, someone gives a urine sample and it's sent to a regular laboratory, those samples tend to not um, turn up any microbes in patients with interstitial cystitis. The urine is, is, is believed to be sterile in patients with these conditions with interstitial cystitis. What that has led to is that interstitial cystitis has been lumped under the umbrella of autoimmune diseases. And there are even websites that imply that psychological factors may contribute to interstitial cystitis, which is ridiculous. So understanding that there is a bladder microbiome and that bacteria and viruses and fungi and bacteriophages can persist in the bladder and in the urine revolutionizes our ability to study a condition like interstitial cystitis. And in fact, I looked it up and there are two papers heading in the right direction on that condition um, that have looked at the, uh, the bladder microbiome in patients with interstitial cystitis, and I'll link to one below. Very interesting. It found that the urinary microbiome of participants with interstitial cystitis was less diverse, less likely to contain lactobacillus species, and associated with higher levels of pro-inflammatory cytokines than that of healthy subjects. So what a good new start for the study of interstitial cystitis, which may very likely be a condition also tied 
to persistent pathogens and pathobionts able to drive chronic inflammatory symptoms. So that's uh, my message for today. Look how far we've come. Our new computer-based tools allow us to look and characterize these vastly more diverse microbial ecosystems in areas of the body that were previously thought to be completely sterile. And when we look at them, we realize that these communities in conditions like a UTI can harbor a wide range of pathobionts and path pathogens, persistent pathogens and pathobionts. And we also see that there's a likelihood that these microbes and viruses act and fungi can act together to drive symptoms associated with the UTI. And we also realize that patients may not have to harbor the same mixes of these pathogens to develop the exact same UTI symptoms. And that opens doors for our understanding of just generally how pathogens and pathobionts contribute to a chronic inflammatory disease state. So that's it for today. See you at my next Behind the Tweets.